Hello and welcome to Designing a Children's Garden, a workshop put together for Earth Day Napa 2021. This workshop was originally delivered on April 26th and was brought to you by the School Garden Doctor. The School Garden Doctor is a 501c3 established in 2018 to empower teachers, schools, and communities to grow school gardens that enhance science education, nurture wellness, and foster environmental literacy. And the voice behind the slides is mine. I'm Carrie Stroll, the founder and leader of The School Garden Doctor. When I think about children's gardens and the connection to Earth Day, I think about the seven generations principle, an indigenous perspective that says whatever we do today should sustain the next seven generations. And obviously subsequent generations, if they have the same uh, perspective will sustain in perpetuity. Children's garden design can follow the same principle, but educating children about the natural environment um, is definitely something that is worthwhile for so many reasons, not just for sustainability, but also for children themselves. According to an article by PBS for Parents, gardening with kids benefits their brain, their body, and their soul. And gardening sparks curiosity, a hallmark of scientific thinking, exposes kids to plants, including fresh fruits and vegetables, and it puts them in touch with nature and lets them get dirty. But there can also be some challenges, such as maintenance, safety, and suitability. So this workshop is designed to help reduce some of the barriers of those um, challenges and definitely think about how we can design spaces that are suitable for children. So the goals of this session are to share ideas for creating outdoor spaces and share important steps in the design process. Before we begin in earnest, let's think about the last thing you did outside. So we want to think about our perspectives as adults. So what did you do the last time you spent time outside? And now think of that same question from the perspective of kids. What did your kids do the last time they were outside? Chances are the responses are a little bit different. And so the first step before even thinking about design is to consider kids' ideas. You can ask them. Kids are more than willing to tell you what they think and would like to see in a garden. And in fact, I recently did this. I asked some kids that were participating in a virtual after-school garden club with me, what would they like to see in a children's garden? And they said things like this, messy, messy paths, interesting edible plants, a living wall, maybe with some vines, flowers, but not super pretty flowers. They had some good reason for that. They said super pretty flowers will get picked. They want places to sit, bug houses, stepping stones to explore underneath, looking for bugs. They maybe would like a fairy garden, some succulents, and plants with crazy names. And if you're looking for more ideas, I highly recommend the book Gardening with Emma. It's the first and only to my knowledge book on the market written by a kid. It's a kid to kid guide to grow and have fun. And here's just one two page spread. Emma points out that kids are not grown ups. Whereas grown-ups mostly like a garden space to relax and to look really nice, as she says, for other grown-ups, kids just want to play and have fun. Kids are going to do things that may not be perfect um, for certain kinds of fragile plants, or you know, they want to dig for holes, they want to pick unripe fruit. There are things that a kid's garden should cater to the things kids like to do, within reason, of course. So some features that kids really like are colorful fruits and vegetables, play spaces, flowers, messy areas, worms, insects, and places for birds to nest and create habitat, and anything that leads to surprises or discoveries. Personally, I think of Earth Day as a way to think about our impact, and so I love DIY projects that reuse and reduce and recycle, or as I say, reuse and upcycle. So here are just a couple of fun projects that can be done to create um, places for ha um, habitat and places for birds, butterflies, and bees and things like that. This is a recycled or upcycled or repurposed candy dish. You know, uh, we maybe all used to have a candy dish uh, somewhere in our 
collection of platters that we don't really put out at um, ser for serving anymore. And it can be used to put a little bit of fruit or jam that would be good for birds or even just a little um, puddling area for butterflies. Another repurposable item is just logs or sticks or bamboo, um, hollow bamboo sticks for bee habitat. And finally, um, any kind of building that you can do to make little homes for hibernating ladybugs or other kinds of creatures. Of course, you want to be safe and teach kids about bugs that might be harmful. The only one that really comes to mind right now is dark places do attract sometimes black widow spiders. So be sure that kids know how to identify them and what to do if they find them. So now you have an idea of what kids like. What are the important steps in the design process? After brainstorming the features that will engage your kids, walk around, measure, and sketch the location that you have selected for a children's garden. Take note of any existing elements, especially elements that are um, like water. Is there, you know, where is there access to water? What are some other things that might um, be design constraints? Identify characteristics like sun and shade, slope or drainage, and wind. And then finally, narrow your features down to just one or two to start. Let's see these steps in an example design space. This is a garden area, rectangular lawn that's going to be turned into a children's area as part of the Las Flores Learning Garden. It's adjacent to a community center and the City of Napa Parks and Recreation Department and the UC Master Gardeners of Napa County are collaborating to turn this space from this uninteresting lawn into an engaging children's area. And this is just one of about 15 to 20 planting areas that will be surrounding the whole community center. The first thing to consider is trees. Any garden space must have trees. We need more trees. Trees are an essential component of any garden. They not only provide shade and store carbon and provide leaf litter and add year-round form, but they anchor a space. They really add sort of the backbone to a garden design. So let's consider this space again and add a couple of trees. I've been working with a design team who identified about four planting areas that we'd like to install to kind of anchor the four corners of the largest rectangle of this area. Next, we'll want to fill in some of those planting areas or planting islands, we're calling them, with some suitable other kinds of um, plants. But first, what are the trees that are most suitable for kids? I think about trees for different um, visual variety as well as different purposes in a garden. And I can divide them into evergreen and deciduous. When I think about evergreen trees, I'm thinking about maybe dwarf citrus. Um, a kumquat is particularly interesting because it has a little tiny um, tart fruit that you just can pick right off. You don't even have to peel it. You can eat the skin. It's very interesting to kids. One of my favorite shrubs is an arbutus shrub. It can be tree form as well, but it can um, be a shrub. It's a commonly called a strawberry tree. It's very attractive to birds and provides a really nice year-round form and is very highly drought tolerant. And finally, a fajoa, or um, what's called a pineapple guava, is also another really nice tree. The flowers are edible as well as visually appealing. Trees that lose their leaves, like apple, pear, and pomegranate, I would encourage you to buy in dwarf varieties. Not only will this reduce the amount of leaf litter that you have, but also um, keeps the tree at a suitable height so that children can harvest. One of my favorite native plants is a western redbud. It produces small pink flowers before it um, produces its leaves for the year. And it's also interesting because there's teaching potential around relatedness of plants. The redbud is related to both peas and roses. And then finally, think about maybe oaks that drop their leaves or maples that are always um, interesting and provide a lot of habitat. So now I'm thinking about an aerial view of this space and here is the space after it's been walked and measured and sketched out. And so those four planting areas, as you see, are in the four corners. And um, I've added the four trees, just four icons that would symbolize any kind of tree we might put there. Let's think next about what do we fill in around those trees. 
Here are a couple of lists of plants that appeal to kids, again, divided into annual flowers and perennial shrubs. When I think about annuals, I like to select annuals that are self-sowing flowers, things like borage, calendula, and sunflowers. Not only are the plants edible, but the seeds of sunflowers are edible. Um, the petals of calendula can be thrown into a salad for some color. They don't have too much of a taste. And borage has this very cool star shaped blue flower that can be plucked right off of it does have kind of hairy pokey stems they're not harmful and they also smell like cucumber it's very interesting and then finally um, jerusalem sage scented geranium and lamb's ear on the other side are just always appealing again scented geranium is an edible plant it also as the name connotes has a smell lamb's ear is fuzzy um, very drought tolerant, very resistant, and Jerusalem sage is a favorite for this yellow flower that kids can pull right out of its whorl and drink the nectar right from the bottom of the flower, just like a little straw. So let's fill in this area with some shrubs and then some annual flowers. And as you can see, our space begins to take shape. You can Think about those planting areas as having different themes. So for example, when you're putting these plants together, maybe you wanna have an area that's devoted to native habitat. Maybe another area is devoted to pollinators. And then of course, you wanna have some edibles or some areas that appeal to kids' senses. So something to think about. And then we want to move on to the other area of the garden. In this particular space, we're considering one of the users to be a preschool program that is in the, housed in the community center near the garden space. And so of course we wanna have some play spaces. And here are just two examples of play spaces that would make wonderful additions to a children's garden. On the left is a flower stand. It can be made out of repurposed material. This one's probably made out of pallets or something like that but it also could be something purchased. And basically it creates a context for kids to pretend to be the gardeners and the shopkeeper and the customer. They can um, collect the flowers, pick the flowers, arrange the flowers, sell bouquets of flowers, pretend to make change and have that interaction. And that is exactly the kind of thing kids like to do. They want to mimic real life, but also have a space where they can use their imagination. And sometimes they also just wanna relax and explore. They're, um, picture on the right hand side shows a sunflower house which is made by sowing sunflower seeds closer together than you might normally and then um, bending the flowers in such a way kind of tying them together so that they create a little bit of a, a hidden shade area you can see there's a blanket on the ground this would be a perfect spot for reading or taking a nap or just relaxing outside so we begin to add a couple more of these features. In this image, I've added some shrub perimeter to kind of um, create a barrier for the children's garden, and then a couple of other features like planter boxes that might have flowers in them, digging boxes where kids can really just kind of get into the soil, and then thinking also about things like hopscotch or stepping stones that add a little bit of gross motor movement activity. When seen from above, this starts to look in, like this. And then we begin to add the final features, like maybe we have a central feature that is like a water feature or a sundial in the center of the public area. Maybe we begin to add some archways. Um, there's lots of different um, variety things that you can add. And if you're looking for a little bit more detail in these design process steps, please feel free to check out the blog Steps for Designing a Children's Garden on WordPress called on the blog called Gleaning the Field. It's a monthly publication that I've been putting out since 2016 to share best practices for sustaining school gardens in the 21st century. And with that, um, I'd like to also just acknowledge that the inspiration for this talk came from lots of different places. And in these slides, each of these underlined link, um, titles is a link, and so you can feel free to grab those and take a look at more detail. And I just want to say happy Earth Day and thank you so much for joining this presentation.